You're probably wondering who the heck am I? Uh, sometimes I wonder myself, but I'm that Canadian story. If you're a first generation Canadian like I am, born to two immigrant parents, I'm gonna share a little bit about how I got to where I am today based on the things that I grew up thinking about. You know, as I did some research through the last five years of my life, I realized a lot of things I didn't know. My father was a drummer in Hong Kong, and he played in a pretty cool pop band in the 60s. And he said, I'm gonna go to Hollywood, and I'm gonna be an actor. I don't know how the segue worked, but he worked his way to Hollywood, but he decided to stop in Canada. And when he stopped in Canada, he never made it to LA. He ended up as a waiter at Franz many, many years ago. And he said, I worked at both St. Clair and on college. And as I went through, I remember asking my dad, where did grandpa work when he first came to Canada? And he couldn't quite remember until I talked to my mom about two weeks ago. I said, mom, do you remember when I was four years old? Once a year, you'd put a shirt and tie on me that we would get from Sears. And she'd take me to Old Ed's Warehouse. Does anyone know where Old Ed's Warehouse is? <laughs> King Street, right? Prime Rib. She'd take me in there, and I'll get to that in a bit, but my father told me last week that my grandfather worked on the line at Ed's Warehouse, and I never knew that for 42 years. And he died on my 16th birthday in the same hospital I was born in at Bathurst and Dundas. This is the menu that I found that I remember, because what I want to talk about was what my mom taught me when we went to the restaurant. She taught me about holding doors for her. She taught me about French onion soup. And you're gonna wonder what the heck is about French onion soup. So as a four-year-old kid, you sit at a table and the soup comes. And mom says, we're gonna have French onion soup today. And all I know is that it's soup. I didn't know about the cheese part and the bread part on top. So as a four-year-old, what do you do? You grab the first thing that looks like a spoon and you poke. And so when I poked, the soup spurted out all over my shirt. That was my memory of French onion soup and I never forgot about that memory. But the one thing she did teach me was these things. And as today, when we talk to kids in my day job, my adult job, and my night job, how many people know what place settings are, what, are for what, and what silverware is for what? And these are the things that I still remember in the last five years that my mom taught me. But I go back to the history. My parents came from Hong Kong. Um, my dad came from a restaurant family. I was born here, and we moved to a really nice part of town called Flemington Park. Some people call it North York, we call it Flemo. Then we upgraded to Rexdale, <laughs> on the corner of Martin Grove and Albion. Bottom left, recognize that? State Queen, Rob Ford, that's how long it's been there. <laughs> Something about Rexdale though, for some reason, my father decided to open a restaurant in Rexdale of all places. And that was my first true memory of food. That's my grandpa back there, my grandpa back there. I'll get back to that in a sec. I thought for the longest time Chinese food was Kung Pao chicken, chicken chow mein, sesame chicken, lemon chicken, things that came out of a box because when I was five years old I was in the back helping with the takeout. And I also thought this was Chinese food. <laughs> Ian had showed a slide earlier about American Chinese, Canadian Chinese. And when I was growing up, I didn't realize today when I drive down some streets you see these signs that say Chinese food and hamburgers. Because for us, in order to get people to eat Chinese food, we had to serve fries and gravy, and banquet burgers. And then they gravitated to sesame chicken and egg rolls. But to let you guys know, we don't eat sesame chicken and egg rolls at home. But the most Canadian part about growing up in Canada to immigrant families is what I call this. I call this the great Canadian inspiration. And if any, many, any of you are children of immigrants, where your parents are out working four jobs, uh, uh, four jobs in a day, and you're left with these stories of craft dinner and grilled cheese. And we go to school, and your kids talk, and all the students talk about, oh, do you have grilled cheese? Well, when we're at home by ourselves, and we get a pan, and we make a grilled cheese, we start to experiment. We go into the fridge, and then we start to put kimchi in it, and we start to put Chinese sausage into it. And then we start throwing that into KD. And all these things turn into the things, you saw some of it out there today, Carilla that Korean barbecue taco. I want to get into that because that's sort of where a lot of my food experience went to. And then I moved in, this is, I'm gonna go a little further because when I turned 17, there was an earmark moment. I was pinched at the age of 17, one month shy of my 18th birthday for grand theft. So one month later, I would have been probably in prison. 
but I changed my life. I decided to go to university. And as an immigrant kid for uh, growing up in Canada, my parents said to me, we don't want you to be in the restaurant business. We want you to go to school. Go be a doctor, go be a lawyer or something. I came back from Western, taking English and politics, and I realized that there was a void in my life. And that void was being around food all the time, being around people, serving food. So I took a chance and I took an interview at this place called the Regal Constellation. And the gentleman up top, I don't know if you guys know who that is, but that's Chef Joseph Van Lanten, who was the executive chef there for 35 years. And he was the one that first that taught me about the rules of being in a kitchen. I don't know if Chef Mark McEwen's in the room. Is he here? I know he's here, but I remember doing an event 11 years ago at the casino and by chance sharing a beer with Chef Mark. And he told me that he apprenticed under Chef Joseph at the same time. So it's a real small world. So fast forward. 17, 18, 19 years. My full day job now is at the International Center. We're a million square feet convention facility. This is what we do when we go traveling. Three years ago, I had the privilege of hiring someone by the name of Tafik Shahada. I'm not sure if you guys know who Tafik is, but when you think about terroir, there's a guy who's become sort of a partner for me to learn from. And so this is us when we travel. We eat, and we eat a lot. Everything from donuts and drive through banh mi shops. <clears throat> this is us after one day at a trade show. <laughs> after eating, and then going to a trade show, and then eating again, I said, it's happy hour at the lobby bar. And that was his response. But like a true champ, he had four bourbons anyway. So quick story. We serve about two million people a year. Over 525 events a year. The crazy thing is, old habits do not die. And we talked a little about waste today. In the event industry, and this is just in Canada, on an annual basis, we throw away $27 billion worth of uneaten food. 154 kilograms of poultry, meat, and vegetables we discard. And we have an unaddressed problem with hunger in North America as well as with health and with our supply chain from not buying enough local. And here's a great stat. In the US, 17% of the food that we purchase in a restaurant or a hotel, we do not eat and goes into the garbage. Tafik and I talk about how good we are at composting at the International Center. We do about a, million, uh, do about a ton a week. If we were to break down the food, 80% of it is food that's uneaten that we sell to our customers. So that's one big problem. So that's us. Right? We take a hall that's 100,000 square feet and we turn it into a dinner. And then I enlist someone like Tafik and say, here's your challenge. Can you get creative? Can you turn 500 square feet of rooftop space and turn into 3,000 square feet of rooftop space to grow our own herbs? Can we convince our customers to buy the way we want them to buy? Can we tell them you don't have to eat croissants and muffins every single morning? Because when we wake up in the morning, how many of us have two pieces of pastries a day? Probably none of us do. But that's the continued practice. And as hospitality professionals, we need to educate our customers on how to buy and where to buy it from. One crazy thing that Tafik's working on is he's, he fell in love with sous vide about two years ago, and we bought one sous vide machine. And I said, that's great for the restaurant, but we serve about 1,000 people a night for dinner. Top right corner, we did a dinner for 1,000 people last Saturday. He sous vide beef for 1,000 people. So there is a way. There is a way for us to grow enough in the summertime to at least garnish for 1,000 people in one night. There is a way to find technology to create for your customer for different experience. But what I want to get to is sort of my life again and how it travels. And then I go back to two years ago when I was sitting at my desk and I love my job, I love what we do, but the one thing I said is I still, once again, I'm missing a void. So I took a trip out to LA to eat again Walking down La Brea Avenue, I realized all these food trucks. And I love Korean food, I love Asian food, and I love Mexican food. And I said, I'm going to come back. Why don't I just start creating it and start showing up at events and start putting some food together and showing people what it's like. And so La Brea was born. It's been a fun story about La Brea because one thing about it is, is we've been able to connect with the people that understand about the value of culture and the value of creativity. And then came the evolution of Kanpai, which just opened two weeks ago. I'm a little tired because 
We're going on about 15 hours a day for the last two weeks. But part of the food in Kampai is the Taiwanese food. And the culture about how we're bringing Taiwanese food to Canada. And we put Kung Pao back into the food, so we have Kung Pao cauliflower, and it goes back to our childhood. And then that middle picture on the left there, that is a Joe Louis. We put that in dessert, or as in Taiwanese Mandarin, Chef Ike from Taiwan calls it a Joss Lewis. <laughs> so the story that I have, and the message I have, and this is an indictment, this is just a message, that the young chefs out there today, who we see go through our system, who are enamored with the celebrity of mixology and restaurantship and entrepreneurship and being a chef that is beyond tattoos and a shiny knife. And that's about blood, sweat, and tears. I work 12 hours a day at the International Center six days a week. And the last three to four weeks have been at the restaurant at night until two, three in the morning, sleeping two days, two hours a day. It's not for the money. I think all of us know that it's not for the money. It's the passion. And I think that we're a bit crazy sometimes, too, why we do this and why we go back. But if we don't learn and we don't teach, these are the things that we're going to continue to see. I think every single one of us in this room read every single day how many restaurants are closing. More closing than there are opening. And part of this is that we're not doing enough to educate those that want to learn. We're not educating those that want to be part of the system. And the last thing I think is we're not educating our customer enough. But I think that there's a lot of change that's happening. And so I say, never forget your inspiration, where you came from. Never forget your creativity. Always learn. Most importantly, always teach. Always think where you buy. You know, one stat we looked at was that for every dollar we spend in Ontario or in Canada, that relates to 10 incremental dollars locally. It's an interesting stat that we don't know about. Celebrate and respect culture and always collaborate. And the one thing I have to applaud Terroir about this year is that they've made the step towards pioneering change. They've made the step towards collaborating. And these collaborative dinners that start tomorrow night and Wednesday night is a great indication of where we need to go. Because we can all sit in this room every single year, pat each other on the back, talk about how great we are, but if we don't take this message and go outside and tell the consumer, they will never understand who we are. They'll never understand why it sucks for people to cancel on your reservation. They'll never understand what the indictment like is when they decide to spew their venom online. These are things that we deal with to keep our doors open, to pay our staff, because these guys in this picture, they don't do it for the riches. They do it because they love it, just like we did. And so I go back. I should tell my dad to open his eyes when we take a picture. That's a pretty cool mustache he's got, actually. <laughs> you guys ever have that moment when you smell something and it brings you back? You know, I remember coming home on a Saturday night, either when I was a busser or a waiter or hungover, that on Sunday morning, my mom would still cook congee noodles. And that doesn't matter where I go, if I smell it, it reminds me and brings me back. And two weeks ago, what I realized, the moment when my dad opened his restaurant back in 1977 in Rexdale of all places, the one thing that reminded me of how great that moment was, was when two weeks ago, we opened the doors. And my 10-year-old was with me. And there was no one happier than she was, happier than I was. And so, there was an American author one day back in the 20s that said, successful people are always looking for ways to help others. Unsuccessful people are always looking to say what's in it for me. And so this collaborative dinner that we're gonna do in two nights is a great story of inspiration. Chef Tafik Shahada, who I didn't know, grew up in Chinatown area and had stories of eating in basement restaurants with his mother, street Chinese food that shape how he views food today. And Chef Nui Regular, who owns five amazing Thai restaurants in this city, who was a nurse in Thailand, who met Jeff Regular when he was backpacking, and they opened a stall on the side row of Chiang Mai, fell in love, got married, moved here, and now has five restaurants, street food. And then our story of how Chef Ai Kuang grew up in Taiwan visiting the night markets. And so these are the stories that we share and that we give to each other. 
And so that's my story. If you've worked in a kitchen, you probably understand this picture. This was something that we found on the line last week, and I thought it was a perfect indictment of what our life is all about. And so I leave that with you. <laughs> and I bid you adieu. Thank you so much.